I found this photo I wanted to paint in watercolors, but I couldn't quite figure out which watercolor shades I should mix to achieve this specific skin tone. So I thought of something that has helped me pull up the right skin tone, as you can see right here. And I'm going to share my method with you today, and you'll see it's a pretty simple process. So it works for portraits as well as anything else. So if you like to use reference pictures for your paintings, or even if you just use a color palette, this is really going to help you decide what colors to pick out of your watercolor set to achieve the same shades as what's in your photo. Hey, this is Francoise. Welcome to my channel and let's jump right into the tutorial. I'll start painting my skin tone sphere as I go through all the steps and I'll demonstrate every step as I go. I do a lot of watercolors now, but I have a background with colored pencils and colored pencil is what actually gave me the idea I'm sharing today. Because for colored pencil work, there's a couple of free apps that you can easily download on your phone and these apps help you decide what colored pencil to use for a designated area of any picture that's on your phone. In the method I came up with for myself, there's more to the process than just the app because I wanted to simplify color choice as much as possible, so hang on till the end of the video to get the full step by step. So basically, what you need to do first is to download the app, go find the picture you have saved on your phone, and that's it. The app is asking you to select the pencil set you own. I would suggest to select the 76 Caran Dash Luminance one because I own this set and I know they have a lot of the earthy and natural color designations you will find in watercolors like sepia, paints gray, yellow ochre, and such. But I think the other pencil set choices would work too, so that's really just a very small detail. Now you're looking at your picture within the app and you can see they have a viewfinder there that you can move around. You can even zoom in on your picture and you see at the bottom of the screen a bunch of color names popping up. On the right side is what they call the target color. So the target color is the exact shade your viewfinder is on. What's great about the app is that on the left side there are indications of what more common colors you can mix to recreate the specific shade. So now let's take my photo as an example and I'm going to guide you through my step-by-step -step process to show you how to use this for watercolors. First, I recommend to use a high definition photo reference if you can and then grab a pen and paper to take some notes. The best is to break things up. So for instance here, I'll look at the skin first and I'll focus on the darkest parts. I scroll through the shadows here on the forehead to start with and I see some recurring colors popping up at the bottom left of the app and I write these because I know they're part of the target color I'm seeing on the right hand side and I know color in the skin is very diverse and cannot be rendered by just one shade, right? So to begin with, the more recurring shades you find, the better. Write them down to get a sense of what makes that skin tone. Write just the ones that keep popping up, not everything because we really want to simplify things as much as possible. Most of the time, the names for these colors will be familiar, and if they're not, if you've never seen them in your watercolor set, just write down what they look like. For instance, I write burgundy if I see a dark, deep red shade, or light sage green if that's what I see pops up and so on. I repeat this process on the other shadows of the face, and in my case, the main shades remain the same throughout all the shadows. I see sepia, burnt sienna, olive green, and brown ochre coming up frequently. I also see shades like aubergine and some purples here and there. I don't have them all in my watercolor set, but that's okay. I do this again for my midtones and again for the highlights. What I have here mostly are earthy shades and some greens for the midtones, and for the highlights, it's mostly an apricot shade, a bit of burnt ochre, olive brown, and pure white for the lightest parts. We're done with step one. Now I have a better sense of what's in the skin tone. For instance, now I know that even though my reference photo makes the skin look sun-kissed and golden, which is confirmed by the colors popping up, there are also a few purples and reds here and there, and that's what will help balance everything to avoid that my skin tone looks too yellowish or brownish. So for me, this solved the problem because even though I know that in watercolors you achieve most skin tones by mixing a bit of red, blue, and yellow, all I could spot with my own eyes was brown and yellow and I knew I was missing the mark somewhere and there was a risk of painting something that looks too dull. For step 2, we need to take a look at the reference picture itself and see if we have everything or if we still may be missing something. When I was using the viewfinder earlier, like I said, I did see a few mentions of aubergine and purplish tones popping up 
and I can clearly see there are parts of the skin that look a little more pink, like the cheeks, where the shadows are, and this area underneath the nostrils, and the eyelids as well. I'm also guessing, and that's more from experience, that an extra glaze of pink tone over the rest of the colors I found before would probably give the skin a nice and more natural glow, as long as it remains subtle, so that we keep that sun-kissed look that's still pretty dominant here, and don't end up with a rosy kind of skin tone instead. So I repeat step one and two for the eyebrows, eyelashes, pupils, nostrils, lips, the sclera is the white part of the eyes, and the teeth, and finally the hair and the earrings. So you see this can really be helpful for skin tones or anything else. Step three is to grab your watercolor set and start mixing colors. So keep in mind we're trying to simplify things as much as possible here. So we want to end up with one mix for the lightest parts of the skin, possibly one for the midtones and one for the shadows, no more. I get a scrap piece of watercolor paper to swatch my washes and I start working on the shadows. I'm mixing sepia, burnt sienna, brown ochre, which are colors I actually have and that I previously identified as recurring shades through the app. The closest green I have to what popped up before is my oxide of chromium. So I'm swatching that and I use more green or more sepia or whatever feels right depending on how my mix comes out. I decide to add a color I have that's called Indian Red because what I come up with looks too brown to me. I think it needs more red even though I plan on making a pinkish wash later to make the skin look more natural. And yes, it does look better with a tinge of red so I'm keeping that color combo for now. I could stop there and decide my wash is ready but because I have 5 colors mixed up here just for the shadows. I think it's a bit complicated, especially if I have to make some more of that wash when I paint. So what I want to do is I want to see if in my palette I have a shade that would come really close to this or that would need less mixing to achieve the same thing. And this is when a color chart for your watercolors is super important because you can compare right there and decide. So I try Van Dyke Brown because mine does come close and it has a reddish undertone to it. And by the way, I'm using Windsor and Newton watercolors, I'll link them up in the description along with my other supplies. I'm pretty satisfied with Van Dyke Brown. I think it comes really close to the original mix I was just working on, and it will be a lot more simple to use that rather than mixing a bunch of colors. So now I narrowed my main shade for the skin tone shadows to Van Dyke Brown. I know that I can easily add a little bit more sepia and black to it to make it darker for those even darker shadows. I have sepia and I have a shade called neutral tint that kind of looks like black so here it is. My shadows are Van Dyke Brown mainly, a bit of sepia to make it darker and add to that a bit of neutral tint to make it even darker. That's three colors to achieve the best contrast on this portrait. Remember sepia was a recurring color in the app and black is pretty basic so I know that by adding that to my Van Dyke Brown I'm still on the right track. For the mid-tones, I want to simplify as well, so I decide that a diluted wash of Van Dyke Brown alone should do the trick to achieve a good gradient towards the highlights. For the highlights though, I really need to come up with something else to get the orange pink shades in and brighten up the skin. Looking at what the apricot shade in the app looks like and looking at my reference as well and at my watercolor set color chart, I noticed that brown ochre seems like a perfect fit. It's a lot more yellow than pink, I think, but I already decided before to add pink as a glaze on top of everything else at the end of my painting, so I'm not worried because I know this will be enough to balance all those earthy shades towards something that looks more like skin without affecting the base colors too much. For that pink glaze, I take a look at what pinks I have in my set. Again, the color chart I made is great for that, and I'm looking for something that's not too flashy and not too red either. I'm hesitating between my rose matter genuine tone and my pot of pink tone, so I'm glazing both on top of my previous swatches of the apricot and the Van Dyke brown tone just to see what it looks like and I decide to go for the pot of pink. It's a bit more subtle and I noticed it would also be great for the lips. So I have all the colors on my skin now. I have brown ochre for highlights, Van Dyke brown for midtones and shadows, and sepia and neutral tint for the darkest of the shadows. And now I also have Potter's Pink for the final glaze. 
I think that's pretty manageable. So I move on to step number four, which is to decide in which order we're going to layer those shades. This is why I want to test everything out on my sphere. There are plenty of pictures of spheres online. I just picked one to see where to place the shadows, midtones, and highlights. And I'm working with the sphere and the photo side by side on my laptop because it's important to always keep the reference in mind and try to get all the values you see there onto your sphere. For our instance, in my portrait, there are parts that are more orange, so there will be more brown ochre there. There are some dark parts, some really dark ones, there are some whites, and there are some dark parts including more pronounced pinkish undertones that you can't see elsewhere as much. I usually start with light colors and watercolor and I gradually build up contrast, so my first layer is naturally going to be brown ochre for the highlights. I keep layering that wet on wet, making sure that some areas are more or less saturated with brown ochre and leaving a white spot on the sphere, as I would for a regular portrait on the nose tip and lips for instance. On the reference photo itself, you can see some areas are more apricot as the app calls it as others. So again, I really try to get a variety of values for that one shade on my sphere. Next, I want to work on midtones, again like I would on a regular portrait. So I apply light washes of Van Dyke Brown and I go darker and darker and darker to make a gradient, to the point where I'm adding sepia to the Van Dyke Brown wash, where the sphere gets noticeably darker, and then neutral tint to the Van Dyke Brown plus sepia wash, where it gets even darker. It's starting to look really good, but I want to glaze a bit more brown ochre over the top because it's looking too brown. It's lacking shine and that orangey sun-kissed look. The layering and transparency capacities of watercolors are great for that because you can always adjust things as long as you don't go too dark too fast. Last, I glaze my potter's pink shade all over very lightly, and then I insist more in some parts because I keep in mind that the dark part of the cheeks and the eyelids on my reference bear some noticeable pinks, for instance, and I want to see what that would look like using my sphere. I think it's looking pretty good now and pretty close to what I can see on the reference photo. And in case you're wondering, when it comes to the ideal color palette to help you with portrait painting and watercolor, don't worry if you don't have as many color choices as I have, and keep mixing what you do have with the help of the app to find the mix that's going to be the best. However, having some choice, as you can see, is a good thing to simplify the process later on and avoid having to mix a lot of colors. So if you're into portraits, I would suggest to get the most common earthy tones out there. I mean by that, a few yellows and browns, but I'd also get a few pinks, one or two blues, one or two greens, one or two reds, a black shade, and I personally find sepia and paint gray to come in very handy as well for things like eyelashes, pupils, hair, the sclera, and teeth. If you enjoyed this video, please like, comment to let me know, share it on social media, and don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell to be updated on what's to come, because I'd like to build a playlist around portrait paintings, and I have so many other tips to share from all my experiments that if you enjoyed this, I'm really excited for what's to come, and I hope to catch you in the next videos.